Dear guests, good evening. Uh, I would like to first invite uh, Kürşat Aydoğan, our rector, uh, to welcome you. Hello, everyone. Uh, that's what I'm going to do. I would like to extend our welcome uh, on behalf of Bilkent University to the memorial lecture, İhsan Doğrumacı Memorial Lecture of 2023. So today we have a very uh, interesting guest uh, and we'll hear from him uh, about quantum theory. So I don't know how uh, we will, uh, uh, well, uh, deep physics. Anyway, so uh, this year's memorial lecture uh, for a change is being done in this building, a new venue. Uh, prior, uh, in, in, in the past, we did it in different places. Uh, during the pandemics, we did it online. Uh, but this is the first time it is being given in the residence of uh, Professor, late Professor Ihsan Doğramacı and uh, his wife, Aysar Doğramacı. So let me give you a brief information about this building. Uh, as I said, this is the uh, residence of uh, Ihsan and Aysar Doğramacı. The building was uh, constructed in uh, between 1989 and 1991 uh, on uh, a land of uh, 10 acres. Uh, so the total uh, indoor space is uh, around 3,200 square meters. The architect is Erkut Şahinbaş, according to my notes. And uh, it's over three uh, stories. So uh, dur during their lifetimes, Ihsan Doğramacı and Aysel Doğramacı hosted several events in this uh, hall uh, by inviting uh, state dignitaries, uh, heads of state, politicians, scientists, business people, and of course their friends. Uh, so in a way, uh, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be exaggerating if I say that this building, this hall has witnessed the history uh, of the country and the region. Uh, so when the building was completed in 1991, uh, Doramaji family decided to donate the building to Ihsan Doramaji Foundation. And uh, during their lifetime, they lived there. And of course, after uh, when uh, Aysar Doramaji passed away in 2016, uh, the building uh, just transferred to Doramaji Foundation. And uh, Bilkent University and Ihsan Doramacı Foundation made, uh, signed a memorandum of understanding about the use of that building. So as Bilkent University, we'll be using this building for various uh, social, uh, cultural activities, for lectures, uh, concerts, uh, and art exhibitions. Uh, so this is uh, the, a lecture that we are going to have today uh, in, the, in this building. So, uh, well, uh, I hope uh, you'll enjoy today's meeting. So, uh, Typhoon Jum, I guess you are going to present the uh, program. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, uh, several months ago, uh, Bilal Tanatar informed me that uh, two distinguished uh, scientists from uh, Sweden will come to Bilkent for the fall semester. When I searched the internet, I realized that this is an excellent opportunity for us to organize the Ihsan Doğramacı Memorial Lecture 2023. Then I started thinking about how best to describe the significance of this lecture until I came across with the British sculptor uh, Andy Goldworthy's installment of Towering Stones at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Then I read an essay by Nobel laureate Joseph Goldstein entitled An Ounce of Creativity is Worth a ton of impact. And that was it. Looking at the sculpture, it is composed of 17 balanced stones, like a pyramid. And the important thing is, the bottom stone is 20,000 times higher than the top stone. You can look at it, you can look at the stones top to bottom 
or bottom to top, just like scientific discoveries. Nowadays, we frequently hear news in the media that scientists discovered a cure for cancer or dementia presented as the bottom stone. But with the passage of time, the discovery may somehow shrink or even diminish to the top stone. Conversely, scientists every now and then report observations and insights that have, at first glance appear as the top stone, so little, but with the passage of time trigger an avalanche all the way to the bottom stone. The latter is what the Isandora Maji Memorial Lectures convey uh, in my uh, opinion. Uh, this year, it is the 12th time uh, that we have a distinguished guest uh, with us uh, who will deliver the lecture in memory of our founder, uh, Professor uh, Thors Hans Hansson. Uh, in the previous years, the lectures were in life sciences, probably a reflection of our founder's origin in medicine and child health. But this year, it will be in physics. And finally, uh, I would like to share with you uh, uh, my wish for the future uh, lectures. Our own graduates who make significant contributions to science that will illuminate us with their discoveries. I have a, a selected uh, example uh, here uh, of Bilkentiers who are working on fundamental scientific questions. Mete Atatürk, for example, is now the director of the world-renowned Cavendish Laboratory, where electrons, neutrons, and the structure of DNA was discovered. He is measuring particles of light, an experiment previously thought to be impossible. Chala Erol, who is at the forefront of glial cell biology. Hatice Altu, who increased the speed of laser 100 times. Ali Ertürk, who revived the tissue investigation technologies of the 1800s and invented a technique called DISCO. What it does is very interesting. It renders tissues and whole body preparations transparent, which is an immense uh, uh, advancement uh, for uh, different types of diseases. Uh, and also Kvanch Birsoy, who defines the metabolic dependency of can cancer cells for the development of novel treatment modalities. Again, for treatment purposes, immensely uh, important. We have a, also a graduate who discovered a, a galaxy, uh, Burçin Mutlu Paktil. Süleyman Gülsiner, who delved into what is considered an impossible problem to uh, decipher. This is human behavior at the molecular level. He is now probing into this very difficult question by uh, analyzing and discovering the genes for schizophrenia. Finally, of course, I would like to mention as last our uh, precious Furkan, Furkan Öztürk, who was recently applauded by the scientific establishment through his insights into homochirality and the origins of life. I am confident that, given enough time, their discoveries will become like the bottom stones of Andy Goldworthy's uh, sculpture. Now we will uh, view the movie uh, entitled uh, The Isandora Maji Spirit, and then uh, we will hear the a mini concert uh, by again our own students, Nil Ipek Shabi, Belit Chifchi, 
and Elif Naz Karabulut, who will perform Franz Josef Haydn's uh, piano trio Mi Binur. Uh, and then uh, Bilal Hocam will introduce our uh, guest of uh, honor to you. Uh, uh, thank you very much.
Okay, thank you. Uh, it's a great honor and a privilege for me to uh, introduce this year's uh, Isan Doramoji Memorial uh, lecture, uh, lecturer, uh, Professor Thors Hans Hansen. Uh, Hans Hansen received his uh, PhD degree in 1979 in, uh, in the University of Göteborg in Sweden, 
uh, working on theoretical high energy physics, uh, which meant, I guess, quarks and, uh, and, and quantum chromodynamics for the experts. He then uh, held uh, postdoctoral positions at Nordita, at uh, MIT, uh, CERN in Europe. To those who don't know what Nordita is, uh, it's a very prestigious uh, theoretical physics uh, institute for uh, Scandinavian countries uh, with headquarters in Copenhagen. Um, he held a faculty position at the uh, State University of New York uh, at Stony Brook uh, till uh, 88, after which he joined the University of Stockholm in Sweden, and uh, he's been there ever since, I guess, apart from uh, some visiting positions in various places, uh, both in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, uh, too many to uh, recite here. Um, Hans Hansen is a member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and also the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters. And uh, he was a member of the Nobel Committee for Physics up until recently, I think till uh, 2022. Um, said uh, he did his PhD work on theoretical high energy physics, but uh, in later years uh, he moved towards uh, low energy meaning condensed metaphysics, applying uh, field theoretical methods on uh, condensed matter problems, in particular uh, quantum hole liquids. Uh, maybe he'll uh, talk about those a little bit here. Um, but uh, equally importantly, he's a very good uh, uh, popular, popularizer of uh, physics and science uh, uh, <coughs> topics. And he's well known for, uh, uh, for such talks. And I believe his uh, talk today, entitled The Five Wonders, and Five Wonders of Quantum Mechanics, is also going to be one of those. Um, I was told that uh, I should cut the introduction short. So without further ado, I, uh, I give you Hans Hansen. So first, thank you, Bilal, for the nice introduction. And I should also say that without Professor Natar, I wouldn't be here because I was invited to spend the fall in his groups in the physics department here at this beautiful campus of Bill Kent University. And when I got the invitation to give this lecture, I looked up a little bit on the web about the person that we are honoring today and I realized that I understood why you want to have these kind of lectures because as we have learned here it was a thoroughly remarkable person a physician a scientist a philanthropist an educator an entrepreneur you are rightly proud of him and it's an honor to give this lecture in his memory and for that I also should uh, thank Pro Professor Chekhan for inviting me to give this lecture. So I'm a quantum physicist and uh, now let's see here we should get this in presenter mode. So, I'm a quantum physicist, uh, so it's natural that I talk about the quantum world to you. And uh, uh, I know exactly when I decided to become a quantum physicist. It was in 1971, a small apartment in Gothenburg, my girlfriend's apartment, and I was taking the first course on quantum physics. And for the first time, I saw this wonderful connection of the deep mathematics, this beautiful mathematical structure of quantum mechanics, and how that could be translated into observable phenomena and experiments in the real world. So I was hooked on that. I gave up all plans to become a mathematician, which was my ambition before that, and decided to become a quantum physicist. So now 
I will take you for a tour of quantum physics. So I called the talk here Five Wonders of the Quantum World. Why five? Well, why not? I mean, seven sounds a bit pretentious, so I picked five, and seven might be too much. And if there had been another lecture, another quantum physicist would presumably have picked some other topics than the one I picked, which I listed here. Uh, but I tried to take a mixture of things that you can relate to that you know, like the stability of matter. But perhaps you never really sort of contemplated how come that matter can be stable. We talk about that. Uh, other things that you presumably have heard about, like quantum entanglement and quantum information technology, quantum computing, quantum cryptography, you know, everything is quantum that you've heard about. But I will talk a little bit about that also and tie it to topological matter and anions that you certainly haven't heard about. And I will try to explain to you a little bit what that is about. And uh, uh, I was very happy to see these stones that I showed, because I think that at least some of the things that I'm talking here are at the bottom, the stability of matter. Other things like the quantum computers might be up there on top. They don't really exist yet. But who knows? Perhaps they will also come to the bottom of what we are doing in society someday. OK. So stability of matter. I will first tell you about a deep concept in quantum theory, which is that of identical particles. And from that, we will go to fermions and bosons. But we should start very, from the very beginning. And here I have to excuse myself because I'm a Mac person. I had a keynote presentation. Oh, no, sorry, it did work. Sorry, I think here. Yes, I thought it was the PowerPoint, but it is the keynote. So this is a classical particle in a box. And what is that? Well, you give it the push, and you see it bounces back and forth. And the classical description of this particle is that it has a trajectory. At every point in time, you can tell where the particle is. You push it a little bit more, it goes faster. Higher energy, then it goes faster. This is a very simple example of a classical system. Now, let's confront that with what a particle in such a box would look like in quantum theory. And here we have it. Uh, let me see here, is, where is the laser pointer here? What, what do I press? Uh, oh, that one. Okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, that doesn't work. Okay, then I will have to describe it to you. Yeah, it's absorbing, I know. And I don't have a stick here. So I just have to tell you. Look to the left, and you see, uh, you see some curves here. What is it? Well, in quantum theory, everything, whatever quantum system you can think of, which means whatever you can think of, because the world is quantum, any such system is described by the quantum mechanical state. And the quantum mechanical state, we uh, have the notation, we note it with the Greek letter psi. And this psi can be something quite simple or something very complicated, depending on what system we are looking at. Here we are looking at a very simple system, just a particle bouncing back in one dimension in a ball like that. And then this quantum this quantum state is very simple. It's just a function. I've written here as psi of x. And you see on the left, you see various examples. And they look like waves. And that's true, uh, because they obey the same equation as a wave on a violin or a cello would. But the interpretation is quite different. First of all, you see that I draw many of these. And these different curves correspond to the particle having different energy. The thing that in classical physics was that it moved at different speed. Here, it corresponds to having one bulge, a bulge and a valley, two bulges and a valley, etc. The more you have, the higher energy. 
But what is it? What is this function? And it turns out that that function by itself is nothing that you could observe. But what you can observe is the square of that function, which I have drawn on the right hand side. And there you can see that the thing that became negative, now we square it, so it becomes positive. So this is a positive thing. And that has a direct interpretation. That value is the probability to find the particle at that point. And already you see something that is fairly strange, namely that that probability is zero at several points here. Very strange. The classical picture is particle going back and forth. In quantum mechanics, you say there are points where the particle never is. Yes, that's one of these strange things with quantum mechanics. I won't talk much about that, but it's good to know. Now, when I was a student, that was just a thought experiment, having one particle in a box. You couldn't do that. But technology has moved so much. Here on top, I show a picture, something I think this, this was done in the 80s. I'm not really sure. It is a picture of a corral, a, a circular box that is made by putting iron atoms on a flat copper surface, 48 of them here. And then you put an electron inside. And these ripples you see inside this coral is exactly the thing that I showed you on the previous picture in one dimension. It's the probability to find the electron at that point. And when I was preparing this, came the Nobel Prize in chemistry of this year. And I, I couldn't resist putting in this picture below. That's from the presentation of the chemistry Nobel Prize. This is what's called a quantum dot. It's a bunch of atoms in the middle there. It's many of them, but you know, not very many. And they form a three-dimensional such box. And there you can also see these energy levels just that I showed you in one dimensions. So you can have these boxes in one dimensions I showed you. You can have the coral, you can have the quantum dots. But they all have this thing in common that they are different energy levels for the particles. Now, I will turn to structure of atoms. And I know there's a bunch of chemists here. I like my wife, biologist. They all learn about atoms. And you learn that electrons are in shells, and different atoms corresponds to having different shells of electrons. But you might not have asked yourself the simple question, how come that this is possible? Because just imagine what you are doing. You have a positively charged nucleus, and then you have negatively charged electrons. So think of it as a positively charged balls, and then all these small negatively charged balls. What would happen? Oop, they would, of course, collapse. That's what you would expect. How come that they don't collapse? How come that you can build up more and more complicated atoms by adding more electrons? That's the question. And that was something that was solved early on in quantum theory. But to explain that, I must first explain to you what is identical particles. Now, in classical physics, you can have things that are sort of the same, identical. In Sweden, Swedish, you say they are like two berries. You know, you cannot tell them apart. In, in uh, English, they say it's like two peas in a pod. I learned from Typhoon that in Turkish, you say it's like two melons in a, uh, melons in a chair. I like that picture, but I couldn't really get a good picture of it because the melons didn't look very similar on that picture that I had. Uh, but let's take another example. Uh, these uh, ping pong balls there, they look pretty simple, similar when you look at them. But if I magnify 
and you look more carefully, at least those in front can see that. They are not really the same. There are small bulges in it, small dents, etc. And in classical physics, you see, you cannot make two things absolutely identical. It's impossible because you can always put some little, little dent or some little piece of paint or something on it. You cannot have identical particles. And that is the difference from quantum theory. Because in quantum theory, just because quantum, quantum means some smallest amount. If you try to take an electron and put some smallest amount on it, you cannot do that. You will get another particles. So all electrons are really, really identical. And so are all protons. And so are all neutrons. And so are all photons. So this is a fundamental thing, that you have these particles that are really identical. And why is that so important for, um, for how we build atoms? Well, then we have to ask the next question. Namely, I told you how to put one particle in a box. Now, we put two particles. How do you do that? Uh, and then it turns out that there are two groups of particles. All particles belong to one of two families, the social and the antisocial. So examples of the asocial are electrons, protons, neutrons, helium-3, it's a kind of helium. Then we have social particles like photons, particles of light, phonons, particles of sound, helium, hydrogen, etc. And what's the difference? What do I mean when I say social and antisocial? If you see on the left-hand picture here, I have shown a, a set of these energy levels. The lowest energy lowers down, then comes the next, then comes the next. You put one particle, put it in the lowest one. Where would you put the next one? Well, you would say, I would put that also in the lowest if I want to have something at low energy. But you cannot. For the anti-social, asocial particles, you can only put one particle in each one of these levels. While for the social particles, they actually like to be in the same level. So if you put two or three or four, they tend to clump, to cluster in the bottom. And you get what's called the Bose condensate. You might have heard of it. While the asocial one just build up higher and higher. And then, if you are at finite temperature, you can have a few that sits on top of this also because they get kicks from thermal bath. And I put some name here for the people who were the ones who sort of discovered these properties. For the antisocial one, Wolfgang Pauli is the important person. And for the other ones, the Sanjaram Bose and Albert Einstein, and the particles are called fermions and bosons. Bosons of the Bose and fermions after another famous physicist, Enrico Fermi. So, what does now this have to do with atoms? Well, atoms are not boxes, of course, but because of the positive nu nuclei, the electrons are attracted to the nucleus. So, effectively, that forms like a box. So when you put in one of these asocial electrons that fills one of these energy levels, now that's taken. It's excluded. So when you put the next one, you have to put it somewhere else, and the next one somewhere else. And in that way, you can build up this structure with electrons that gets further and further away from the nuclei, and you can get more and more complex atoms. Thus, atoms thus molecules, thus cells, thus life, thus violins. So this is a very, very fundamental tenet of quantum physics. And it wouldn't work if there wasn't identical particles and if it wasn't these two groups where the electrons are the asocial ones. And remember these two groups, because I will come back to that later. Now, I will switch gear, and I will tell you about matter under extreme conditions. Uh, what I said now, earlier, was about ordinary matter. But now, with modern technology, 
we can in the laboratory create matter and create systems of matter that are extreme. Very low temperature, very high magnetic field, very high pressure. And we can also engineer them in special way. So I showed you an example of this, of this chorale where you had an electron that was in a two-dimensional box. We can make layered materials where electrons can move only in a plane. It's very hard for them to move transfers like that, but they can move almost freely in a plane. That's one thing. And by microfabrication, we can make complicated chips. We can trap atoms by laser beams, etc. This chip, I will come back to a little bit at the very, very end. So, now I will tell you with that background about topological matter and a special kind of topological matter. And I will and explain to you where the word topological comes in in a little moment. So I will tell you about this thing. I will tell you about topological quantum liquids of which the quantum Hall effect is one example. And I will talk to you about entanglement, quantum entanglement in matter. So I will tell you about the quantum Hall effect. And I'm from Scandinavia, so let's start with polar light. Okay? This is polar light. How does polar light come about? Polar light comes about because charged particles are emitted from the sun. And when they reach the magnetic field of the Earth, they tend to spiral like this, as shown. Why? Because in a magnetic field, if you have a charged particle, it doesn't move straight, it moves in circular orbit. So when something comes like this from the Sun, and you start to feel the magnetic field, it also wants to go around, and it goes in a spiral, like this. And during this spiral motion, it sends out light, and that is the light you see. That's the that's the polar light. Uh, so from that beautiful picture to experiments. I show on the left here, I show what I just said, that when you have a charged particle in a magnetic field, it tends to run in a circle. And this has a very direct and measurable consequence that was figured out, that was found in actually in the 19th century with an American physicist called Hall. And that's the following. If you have a piece of matter, like I show on the right there, and you have a magnetic field, the red arrows here is the magnetic field, and then you drive a current through that material. Now, what happens normally when you have a current that moves in a wire? Then you have a voltage across the wire. Usually you might think of it the other way around, that you put the voltage, you put the battery, and you get a current. Okay? And that's Ohm's law. So it's a proportionality between the voltage U and the current, and the proportionality is called resistance. That's Ohm's law. But now, in this case, it's sort of Ohm's law, but it's strange because the current goes in this direction, but the voltage is in the, is in the um, perpendicular direction. That's all called a whole voltage. And the, still it's a proportionality constant, but the proportionality constant is called the whole resistance. And it's proportional to the magnetic field, not very strange, because if you don't have a magnetic field, in that case you don't have this effect at all. Okay, this was well known, many had measured it, etc. Then, in the beginning of the 80s, Klaus von Klitzing redid these experiments, but in a special way. First of all, he looked at one of these systems where you had electrons that could move only in two dimension, not in the third. We call it a two-dimensional electron gas. Okay? And you can make such materials by having two crystals and you can get such uh, interface between them. But even more, he went to very low temperature. You see here, 1 to 2 Kelvin, that means 1 to 2 degrees from the absolute zero, while we are around 200, you know, zero Celsius is 273 from absolute zero. So this is really cold. 
and he had also very strong magnetic field, much, much stronger than you have on your fridge magnets and anything that you have seen, special equipment needed. And then he saw something amazing. Instead of seeing this proportionality between the magnetic field and the resistance that that formula would send you, you see, instead of a straight line, you see plateaus. Okay? You see plateaus. But it's something really, really amazing with these plateaus. And that is the precision with which you find these plateaus. It's the precision that is about 10 to the minus 9, you know, 0, 8 zeros, 1. That's the precision of the height of this effect. It's called the quantum hole effect. And why is it so amazing? It is because the samples are never perfect. The geometry of the sample is never perfect. It's dirt in it. The magnetic field is never constant. There is all that, lots of things. Why should this be so precise? And this is why we call this a topological effect. Because topology is the part of mathematics that tells you about properties which are stable against changing small things. You know, typical example that people usually take is that they say, you know, you cannot deform uh, a ball into a donut without breaking it apart because the donut has a hole. It's, this is not that kind of topology, but the topology in a more abstract way, but something that guarantees the stability of effects that you see. Okay, and he got the Nobel Prize for this, 1985. Now, where do these, uh, where do these um, plateaus occur? And it's a fairly simple explanation for where they occur. And I will show that to you here. And if you look at the top, you have the magnetic field. The blue thing here is one of these layers where the electrons can move. Okay, now let's put in one electron. Uh, do, do, do, do. I wanted to put one electron. There is one electron. Okay, so classically that would be a particle that moves in a little circle around like this. Quantum mechanics is a wave function, it's like a blob that is sitting there. The point is that if I put a second one, I can put it there. Okay, the cost of putting the second one is the same as the cost of putting the first one. So it doesn't matter where I put the second one, I can put it in very many different ways. So if I have two of these, it's very hard to know where the other one is sitting. But now if I put more and more, remembering that the electrons were the asocial particles, you can see that I cannot put infinitely many because then they start to overlap. And they start to exclude each other. So it's a maximal filling that you can have putting in these things. And that maximal filling, it's called in technical language, a fill Landau level, that's the filling where you see the first plateau. And in a very similar way, you can also understand the second plateau, the third plateau, etc. So this sounds pretty simple, and it's not that difficult. The difficulty is why is it precise? That's the thing that is difficult to understand. And I'll come back to that briefly later. Uh, now, when people start doing experiments, they continue doing experiment. Here is a later experiment. Same kind of experiment, but at much lower temperature. This is 10 to 20 millikelvin. That's like 100 uh, times closer to the absolute zero. And then you start to see these plateaus at other places. Plateaus before, if you call those one, two, three, four. Now you start to see plateaus, for instance, at one third. I put that in red here. This was the first one that was discovered. And again, it's precision. It's one third. It's not 0 0.332 or 0 0.334, 34 or something like that. It's exactly one third. And with one third here, I mean that the density of the electrons here on this plateau is a third of what was in this first plateau that was seen. Now, this 
actually poses a very difficult problem. Because now you have, again, this layer, and you have several of these electrons. And I told you before, I can move them around. So the question is, what pattern do you get? What pattern? And if you were to look at this previous thing down here to the left, you might say, oh, perhaps it's a crystal. Okay? And if you look at this, you say, perhaps it's a gas. Turns out it's neither. It's not a crystal. It's not a gas. It's much more like a liquid. We call it a quantum liquid. And liquid here doesn't mean it's not like water, but it is something that is neither a gas where, pe where particle moves completely freely, neither is it a crystal where they sort of, sort of sit put, but they are more like a liquid. Experiments were very difficult, and the theoretical explanation was actually a strike of genius of Robert Laughlin, who guessed what was the pattern of these electrons in this layer of one third of one of these field levels. He actually guessed the quantum mechanical state, and that's almost unheard of in physics, that you can guess the state of, because we are talking a state not of one particle, not of two particles, not of ten like in an atom, but perhaps ten to the twelve particles. But he did so. Uh, now, this is just an example of a class of states, class of materials, that is called topologically ordered quantum liquids. And I already explained why we call it liquid, that it's quantum, should have been clear also, and the topology has to do with these precise values of the resistance and also some other precise values that I will talk about. Uh, I should already here say that this is actually also of great practical importance because the height of these plateaus, of these integer plateaus, one and two, easy to measure, very precise, and it's actually so precise that the new definition of the unit of ohm, the unit of resistance, is actually based on this effect. Uh, so, in metrology, it's important. So, I already said that we have several of these topologically ordered liquid. And you might ask, what do they have in common? And they have several things in common, actually. But I will focus on two things that they have in common, namely something that is called long-range quantum entanglement. And that you don't understand because you don't know what entanglement is yet. I will explain to you what entanglement is and then say what it means. And also that it has a new kind of particles, particles that are called anions. And these anions have fractional charges. And that I will also spend some time on. But let's do it in order. First, I will explain to you what quantum entanglement is. Also because this is something that you see so often in, you know, in popular <coughs> science, etc. Well, what, what is this entanglement? So I will tell you about polarized light, entangled photons, and remarkable insight of John Bell that was at the core of last year's Nobel Prize in Physics. So polarization of light. Okay, If you have a bulb, and out come light. Now, this light is what we call unpolarized. And what does that mean? You see, a light wave is vibrating electric and magnetic fields. It's like an electric field that goes up like this, like a wave. You have presumably seen the picture and it's illustrated there. But it can go in this direction or in that direction or in any direction. But let's think of this one that goes like that. Call it vertical and that we call horizontal. And then you put a polarizer in front. I call it a V-filter because it filters out the V-polarization. This is nothing but the polarized sunglasses, polarized soul glasses that you have presumably seen. And if you ever played with those guys, either in school or you had two pairs of glasses, you could see that if you put uh, one of these uh, glasses and then you take another one and you turn it, and you see that at some angle, 
you see exactly the same and at some angle it becomes black. Because if I take such a V-filter and put a V-filter afterwards, then everything goes through. If I put an H-filter, horizontal filter, nothing goes through. This was well understood long time ago. This part of the classical theory of light that you have polarization. Now, in quantum theory, phenomena can be thought of both as waves and as particles. And that's true also for light. So an alternative way of looking at light waves is to think of them as a stream of light particles, a stream of photons. Okay. Now, I also told you that any quantum system is described by a quantum mechanical state. So is a photon. And I write it here, call it psi, this funny symbol like this thing is something that we used in physics. It's a notation that was introduced by Paul Dirac, a very famous physicist of the last century. So it's this guy, psi, that is the quantum state. And it consists of two pieces. One piece is V and one piece is H, and then there are two numbers in front. I call them alpha and beta. These are numbers. Now, how does that connect to what I told you earlier about this wave function? Well, it connects because alpha squared, the square of that number, is the probability for this photon, this light particle, to pass through a V filter. And beta squared is the probability for it to pass an H filter. Okay, so that's how it ties to this probability interpretation. And I wrote an example here where these two alpha and beta both are one of a square root of two. If I square each one of them, it's a half. So it's a half probability to go, go through V and half probability to go to H. Okay. Now, this system here where I have two possibilities but I can have them in a combination that in quantum theory we call a superposition. Having such a two-level system is what's called a qubit. I'll come back to it later. The qubit is the basic unit of quantum information and it's the basis of all hype about quantum computation, quantum information and uh, cryptography, etc., etc. But that will be later. All right. Now, entanglement. So this is one of the important slides here was quantum entanglement. Well, if you take a laser beam and you run it through a certain kind of crystal, you can get out for each photon, comes out two photons. A bit lower energy, of course. Now, again, I write such a state. And now, the first one is HV. What does that mean? That means that that particle can pass an H filter, the other particle that comes out there can pass a V filter. But then it's another possibility that the first particle can pass a V filter and the other one can pass an H filter. So that is VH. And again, this state I get out from this crystal is a superposition. So I don't know whether before measuring which one is which, which one is V, which one is H. But in what I knew is that whenever I see a V here, I see an H here. Whenever I see an H there, I see a V there. They are what we say quantum entangled. And now you might think perhaps it's not so strange. Uh, an example that is taken is, you know, this person the physicist called Battleman, he was always a little bit badly dressed. He always had a black sock and a, a white sock. So if you saw the one foot at the left sock, you could immediately say that the other one was black. So this sounds like perhaps not such a big deal. But now I will tell you that, well, this entanglement is a much, much bigger deal. And the person who understood that was John Bell at CERN. And he proposed an experiment that was later performed by John Clauser and his student Friedman. And the experiment was the following. That you have this source here, that's the blob bass in the middle. I would point with the laser pointer if it worked okay. And 
this source send out this entangled photon. V here and H there and H there and V there. And they are entangled. And then at these measuring stations in quantum information, they always call them Alice and Bob, A and B, okay? They do various kind of measurements. So they measure what kind of filters can these things go through. They take some filter and then they see, can it go through or not? And they take lots of data, okay? Then what John Bell proved, and now this is mind-boggling. If you think you understand it, you didn't, okay? So that is that normally you would say that you make an experiment, you measure something which is there. So here comes this particle. I measure properties of that particle. There must be something in that particle that tells me what the result is. Classically, you could say I have a red or a black. So it was red all the time, black all the time, and I measured black, and then I know the other one was white. Here, the thing that is mind-boggling is the following, that if you assume that there is such a message, something what we call hidden variable, that comes with the particle that you measure, that is in contradiction with quantum theory. You are not allowed to think of it that way. These things are fundamentally entangled. The information is really distributed between these two particles in a way that you cannot think of like the socks. That was John Bell's discovery. And uh, Clauser did the experiment and showed that quantum mechanics is correct. So that way of thinking, however intuitive, is wrong. And that's the source of, uh, of entanglement. That was the Nobel, last year's Nobel Prize also. Um, now, we come back to these quantum liquids. What does entanglement have to do with them? Well, this was something that was realized quite a bit after the discovery. And that is that if you take normal matter, this, I, the lower picture here is meant to mean normal matter, like a crystal or something like that. And you make an imaginary line. You don't divide it. Just think of a division line. And then you ask, how are the particles, in this case electrons, how are they entangled? And then in normal materials, the entanglement always occurs between particles which are close together, close to this division line. So the entanglement between region A and region B is something that only occurs here. While in these topologically ordered states, these liquids, the entang this is some artist's representation. This entanglement in long range, that is that you have entanglement with one particle in A and one particle in B, which are far from each other. And you can mathematically, you can also quantify the amount of entanglement. But that is why the concept of entanglement is important for characterizing uh, materials and specifically these liquids. Uh, but it's more to these liquids. And I told you there was yet another thing I was going to tell you about, namely the funny fractionalized particles. So they come next. So uh, I will tell you about vortices. So vortices, they come in all sizes. Here is a tornado. Here is what you see in a bathtub. The picture down there is what you see if you look on top of a um, superconductor and you put some magnetic filaments. These dots here are actually magnetic vortices that can penetrate the superconductor. And it turns out that these quantum hole liquids behave a bit like superconductors. So they are actually vortices. And these vortices, as I show you now, has very strange properties. And they are related to topology. Uh, so say that you have such a vortex. What properties could it have? And now I should tell you one thing before I say that. And that is that these vortices, they can move in this two-dimensional plane. And they have properties. They have charge. They have mass. So you can think of them 
as particles. Although they are not fundamental like electrons and protons, still you can think of them as particles. We do that all the time in physics. When you look at the solar system, you can think of the Earth as a particle moving around the sun. So we all the time think about what is a particle depends on what scale you look at it. We call them quasi-particles. OK, now if you look at the picture, you can see that this liquid of electrons, of negatively charged electrons, are uniform. Then you put a vortex. That means that you have a depletion. You have less of this negative liquid. So that means that you have a charge which is positive. That's not very strange. What is strange, and I won't show you how to calculate it, but it's, you can calculate that, is that the charge is quantized, it's precise in the same way as these uh, resistances I told you about. So for that particular level I showed you, the one-third level, turns out that the charge is exactly, precisely one-third of the electron charge. And this has been measured in many experiments. I will tell you about one later. But, oh, I should have said that. Now, we know that we have such quasi-particle, they have funny charges, but are they protons? Or, or are they fermions or, bos or bosons? Are they social or are they antisocial? That's the next question. You might not think it's fun, interesting, but I think it's an interesting question. Okay. So I was very happy when I went to the modern museum in Eskishihir some weeks ago. And uh, it's a very interesting museum, by the way, and it's pretty new. So presumably many of you haven't been there. I can recommend a, a visit. It's, a, it's architecturally a very, very interesting place. And I saw this uh, <coughs> Sculpture. It's made on bamboo. It's a Japanese artist who is a fifth gener fourth generation bamboo artist. I didn't even know that bamboo artists exist, but they do. And I saw this thing. And this looks like you are making a braid out of vortices. And it turns out, strange enough, that to answer the question whether these guys, these vortices are if, if, whether they are fermions or bosons, social and antisocial, has to do with braiding vortices. Okay? So I will try to explain that to you. Uh, so we have to go back and look a little bit more closely to fermions and bosons. So say that I have two particles that are sitting at A and B. They can sit at two places, you know, A and B. And I have a quantum mechanical state that is psi of. To the left here, the black particle, say an electron, sits at A. The red particle, say a proton, sits at B. And now I change them, okay? So that means that the proton sits at A and the electron at B. And that's, of course, a completely different state. I can tell the difference, OK? Here you have a proton, here you have an electron. That's not the same as having an electron here and a proton here. So it's two different states. But now, remember the concept of identical particles and look to the right. Now, it's one at A and one at B, but they are identical. And then I switch them, OK? It's the same physical state, physical state. But is it the same quantum mechanical state? And the answer is no. And if you had been really observant, you might have even anticipated why it's not the same. Because here I show you again one of these waves to the left, one of these wave functions. But I also saw the negative wave functions, you know? So the, you have the blue and the, the yellow one is just the negative. But the square is the same. Okay? And the square was the only thing that matters. So, there are two possibilities. When I switch these two, I can either get a plus sign or I can get a minus sign. And that's the only possibility, sir, because it's something that should, if I do it twice, I should go back to the same thing. Okay? So, for fermions, we have um, the minus sign and for bosons the plus sign. And you can immediately see why I said that. Because say that they sit at the same place. 
So I had two particles sitting at the same place. For bosons, that is fine. But for fermions, if I let them switch sign, they still sit at the same place, but I get a minus sign. But the only number which is equal to the negative is zero. So that means that you cannot put two of these antisocial particles, two of these fermions, at the same place. That's another manifestation of this exclusion that I told you about called, called the Pauli exclusion system. But in both cases, and this will be important for the next, is that if I do it twice, so for bosons, I plus, I change again, I get another plus, plus, plus is plus. Now I do it for fermions. I pick up a minus sign, change again, pick up another minus sign, minus, minus is plus. So in both cases, if I do two of these exchanges, I'm back to the same system. Now, is this always true? That's the question. And it turns it's not true. And there is another possibility. So, 1977, a, part, a paper was published long ahead of its time, I would say, by Jun Magdalenos and Jan Mürheim, two uh, Norwegian physicists. Uh, I know them well, especially Jun Magdalenos that I worked with uh, for many years, who came up, came to understand that no, there are other possibilities. But there are only other possibilities for particles that move in two dimensions. I mean, on a personal note, I can say I was first heard of this when I went for a walk outside the Norita Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen in the park. And he told me about this thing. That must have been 1980. 80, presumably. I didn't understand much of it. And certainly, I didn't understand that I would sort of spend many years of my career studying these funny particles that later by Frank Wilczek was called anions. And the, their analysis was based on braids. And I cannot go through details here, but I can just sketch what is happening. Now, when I said on the previous slide that you do this exchange, what does that mean? That looks like something mathematical here. I just changed in the function something. But you can think of this also really physically. You can think of the particles moves around. One moves around the other, as you see on top there in the plane. But if you were to follow that in space-time, you would say at different times, where are the particles? They would trace out two curves like this. One would sit still, same position at all the times. Time goes upward here, and the other one moves in a circle. You know, so in a sense, it's a little bit like the spiraling <laughs> electron, but here they move just in one plane, and this is time. And you can think of having more particles and more complicated patterns. These patterns are called braids. And what Lenos and Mirheim understood was that to understand what is happening with the quantum state of such particles, you have to understand the braids. And these braids are stable by topology. And what do we mean with that? Let me give you a little in illustration of this thing. Okay? So here is one particle. Out here is the other one. And now I'm going to move in two dimensions. Okay? So I'm going to be in a plane, and I'm going to take this around the other like this once, twice, three times. I have a winding number, okay? And you can see that the only way of getting rid of that winding number is either to go bay, back to do the inverse, or I can, of course, break the cable. This thing, breaking the cable, that's the thing that what topology says, you are not allowed to break things. So this winding number, as the mathematic, mathematicians call it, is a topological invariant. But only in two dimensions, because why? Say that I'm allowed to go out in the three dimension. Oh, like that. And I didn't have to break, I didn't have to go back, 
I just have to go out in the third dimension. So this new possibility, which is called anions, only exists in two dimensions. And that also explains a bit, because you might say, why didn't people ex uh, discover this earlier? Well, because technology was not at the, la at the point where you could do experiments in two dimensions. But having said that, I have to say also that this fundamental paper was written <laughs> based purely on theory. So these are the anions. Now, theorists are very happy. Experimentalists are less easy to impress. They say, hmm, this sounds to me just theory. What about the experiments? Do these things really exist? Or is there something that you came up with? Hmm? OK. How to observe them? And that's a complicated thing, but I sketch it a little bit. Remember these particles that were sitting in the magnetic field and going in small circles like that. That was this quantum hole liquid. Now, I draw something like an infinite plane, but of course, every real experiment, you have an edge. You have a finite sample. What happens at the edge? Now, think of these small rotating things that comes like this. It comes like this, like this, like this. But then it comes here. It bounces. It bounces like that. We call it the skipping orbit. And if you think of it, they will go in one direction in, on the upper and the other at the lower. And whether they go like that or that, or that depends on how they rotate. And that depends actually on the direction of the magnetic field. So you have this what's called skipping orbit or edge states. And those are the things that is measured in experiments. And the experimental setup is the ones that I show here. So the hatched region is one of these quantum hole liquids, one of these one third liquids. That was the first experiment that was done. And the colored things here illustrate how the current can move. So current comes in, and if you follow the blue line, you see it just goes through, comes out to the right. But you have these electrodes that squeezes the liquid. You can do that by electric fields. So you can see this shows that the liquid is squeezed. And that's actually what is happening. You don't squeeze the liquid in this way by putting voltages. So if you look at the red one, it passes and then it tunnels over to the upper edge. That's a quantum mechanical phenomenon that you can tunnel. And what is tunneling here are the anions that lives in this liquid. And then it goes back. Or it can be like the green, that the tunneling occurs already in the first one, and then it goes back. And now I've told of these anions as particles. But quantum mechanics, all particles are also waves. So when you detect here in the detector, then you will see that there comes a green and there comes a red. And that is like waves that depends on these anions. And you get interference patterns. And those interference patterns, they carry information of the nature of these particles that tunnel these anions. And then it becomes a little bit of a detective story, actually. Uh, uh, that, yes, no, let me say one more thing. Yes, so this is the picture. And then the idea is that if there is an anion inside here, if you could put an anion there, then the red current would encircle that anion, while the green wouldn't. So you would be able to see the presence of this because you have such an encirclement, such a braid. So then there was a race for anions. And here theory was very important because theory told you what you would see. What would these interference patterns be? Interference patterns, you mean, you know, like water waves, etc. Here, the interference patterns are just these lines. And on the axis here is the magnetic field and also the voltage that you can push this 
and make this uh, island here a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller. That technicality is not so important. But the widths of these stripes tells you about the charge. And if you have such an extra anion inside, you will see that as a glitch in this pattern. But it was predicted that only if the stripes go this way, you could see the effect, not if it goes that way. That analysis is sort of complicated. I won't go into it. But there was a prediction about that thing. So if you go back to 2012, look here. You see the, uh, the uh, stripes go in the wrong direction. You could still determine the charge. This gives a very good value for the charge. But there was no way you could see the anions. If you go to 2019, you manage to get the stripes in the right direction, but still no anions. And this was amazing experimental work in improving the, the, uh, uh, improving the systems you looked at. And then finally, 20 and 21, stripes in the right direction, and these glitches that you see in the pattern, and those fitted exactly what was predicted by having anions sitting in this system. So finally, 43 years after the prediction by Murheim and Leinos, yes, we can say there are anions. These funny particles that are neither fermions nor bosons, they do exist in reality, something that made at least me <laughs> very, very happy to see. And these experiments, more refined experiments, are going on all the time on this. So final topic, and that is quantum information technology. And what is it? You presumably heard of quantum cryptography, a way of sending cryptographic keys uh, perfectly safe protected by quantum mechanics, by nature. And actually, there are commercial systems you can buy actually doing quantum uh, cryptography. Quantum communication, how do you communicate these kind of things over long distances? That has also been done. Amazing experiment where you have a satellite that can transfer quantum information. These qubits can be transferred from Beijing to Vienna. And in China now and in and other places also, one's building up networks that can connect, quantum networks that can send quantum information that is set in such qubits. And that, of course, quantum computation and quantum simulation. And all these things is based on the con <coughs> concept of entanglement that I explained to you. All quantum technology, a ah, little bit perhaps too much, but basically you can say that all quantum information technology is based on entanglement and on entangled qubits, exactly the kind of things that I explained to you earlier. So the concept of entanglement is something that you should keep in mind and that now you fully understand, I hope. Uh, so the qubit, what's a qubit? A qubit is the smallest unit of quantum information. Just like a bit is the smallest uh, piece of ordinary information. The bit, that is what sits, you know, what, what your memory is, you know, how many gigabytes a byte is, 16 or 32 bits, I think, you know. That's the classical information. The quantum information is this qubit, okay. And one has found out that it can be used to make computations that you cannot make with ordinary computers, at least as far as someone knows. It's hard to prove things here. But quantum computation is something that labs all over the globe is working with. So for that, you need a qubit. And I told you that you've already seen a qubit. This thing, this vertical and horizontal, that is actually a qubit. But the commercial qubits, many of them are working with other systems. What I show you here, you cannot see here, but there are, there are micrometers, uh, which is the 
<coughs> dimensions of this thing. So that's actually a qubit that is built in the Beijing uh, Academy of Quantum Sciences, which is, at least a month ago, it had the world record for long-lived qubits. It's called a transmon. It was developed originally at Yale. So it's, uh, it's built on a chip. Uh, but the problem with qubits and qub quantum information in general is noise. Because they are brittle. This superposition that I wrote here is brittle. If you put noise, it decays into something that is not a superposition. It's just what we call a classical mixture of vertical and horizontal, just like the light that came out of the light bulb. So how do you make, can you make a better qubit that is sort of protected by physics? And there comes the idea of topologically protected qubits. And that's why people are so interested in anions, actually. Uh, many groups working on this uh, in many places, especially Microsoft, has put lots of uh, effort into it. Here is an example. Uh, this is a wire, it actually is two wires here. That's the, um, the orange thing. And at the end of these wires, which are a special kind of superconducting wires, at the end sits anions. Okay? These are not the anions I talked to you about, which had a fractional charge. This is an even more, st even stranger kind of anions, because they are neutral, they don't have any charge. But the way you should think of them is that you take a qubit and you divide the qubit in two. And you put half there and you put half there. They are called majoranas, these modes. And why would you like to do that? Well, you see, now comes the trick. Then if you put noise here where you have the first majorana, the first anion, you cannot destroy the information because the information sits in these two together. Also, putting noise at both places wouldn't destroy it either. Why? Because the noise would have to be correlated. Just as these two particles are entangled, you would need entangled noise in order to destroy the information. And that's why such a qubit would be topologically stable. It cannot be destroyed by local noise. Now, People have worked on this for a long time. They still don't have a good qubit of this type. I heard a talk about it this, this June, and they are making progress. Other people are actually thinking of the kind of anions I said that you have in the plane, and they dream about moving them around by, you know, by, uh, by tips, etc. It's but much of it is presumably fantasy. Whatever it is. It's very interesting physics, it's very fascinating. It might lead to something technological, we don't know yet. But we are now on the top of these stones, so we don't know what happens to it. So with that, uh, uh, well, here is a summary. I don't know, it's getting late anyway, but a few things for you to remember. Remember this of identical particles because that's, that's definitely one of the stones at the bottom. And so are bosons and fermions, and stability of matter. Quantum hole liquids, well, remember that there are extreme forms of matter with very strange properties and these quantized properties. And you might also remember what is a quasi-particle. And in quantum technology, well, that you will be bombarded in newspapers and, broad and newscasts for the coming X years anyway. So you will be reminded. So with that, thank you all for listening. A special thanks to my wife, Shori Maleki, who told me that the first version of this talk was absolutely incomprehensible. No one, <laughs> no one without a, a degree in physics would understand anything, and it would be a complete catastrophe. So I also have to thank her for helping me a little bit. So whatever you understood is due to her, and the rest, I guess, is due to me. And also thank to the Research Council of Finance.
I think it would be a shame uh, if we don't ask questions. Uh, so, uh, if there are any questions uh, from the audience. Spin, or is it one-third? They, they do have spin in a, in a special way. They have something that we call topological spin or orbital spin. Yes, they do. And that's also fractional, by the way. So fermions have a specific kind of spin, and bolons have a specific kind of spin. Yes. And you said you distinguish them. Onions are, are like that. They have one-third yes. spin? Yes, yes. They have. They have these kind of anions have, have also the spin is related to the charge actually in in a mathematically intriguing way, but it's hard to measure, very hard to measure. Thank you for this interesting talk. Just one simple question. Uh, if the particles are entangled, I understand what would happen afterwards. Is that just an observation, or is there a reason, tangible reason, why particles are entangled? Um, if you want to, I can answer in two ways. I mean, at a very general level, basically everything is entangled. But it's very, very hard to detect that entanglement. So. Usually when we speak about entanglement in this kind of context, we talk about entanglement that can be controlled. Entanglement that can be produced and then it can be read out. And that, for that you must have specific protocols and that's actually a big deal in quantum computers because in a quantum computer you typically had lots of these qubits and then you want to initialize them in a certain in a certain state. And then they go through gates, and as they go through gates, they become entangled in a very specific way, and then you measure. So it's engineering in doing that, starting from something which perhaps is not entangled, creating the entanglement, and then measuring. Something from the young people in this corner. Huh? <laughs> On the back. Uh, yes. I'm not as young, but maybe I can ask. Uh, so what is the uh, essential experimental difficulty in producing uh, topologically protected units? There, there are several. I mean, in the particular one that I showed you uh, with the wires and these Majorana things, it is still not 100% established that they are actually there. There is a signature, measurements, a signature in measurements, and that has been observed, and it was observed quite some time ago. But then people realized that the same signature would occur from other effects, and it's very hard to tell the, to, you know, to tell the difference. So that's on the level of, uh, uh, of making one such qubit. The other thing has to do, if you want to do computation, how do you make them interact? And there, in this scenario, there are some ideas that you want to move them by electrical gates and fuse them, but so far, that, in my opinion, is, is still a bit of fairy tale. We have to see in the future. We cordially thank you for this feast of science uh, this evening. Uh, I would like to now invite our uh, rector to present uh, to uh, Dr. Hanson uh, a, a medal uh, that signifies uh, this event. Okay. We have the photographer as well. Yeah. <laughs> so this is the Istanbul Ramajan medal that I would like to present to you for delivering the lecture. So. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. We have a, a reception. Uh, we are invited there. Thank you.